Susan comes to us from Hunter College, um, where she has been on faculty uh, for a while. I won't say how long, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> and um, she actually came to our attention not only because she is an internationally renowned artist, um, but Matt Garrison, who's with us, and the chair of the art department, um, actually was a former student, right, yes. of Susan's. And so um, he has long admired her work, and um, I hope that you will too. It raises some interesting issues. Um, it's part of our season of social justice that the arts across the board have taken on in different forms um, to bring forward some of these issues, like how we treat prisoners of war and suspected terrorists that are being held in areas that are not in US prisons. Um, so that's just one of the many issues. Um, some of the other things that will be coming up, like Mosaic, will address things like the disparity in wages um, and how we are polarizing our selves here in this country because of money. So those are some great issues that I hope that you'll also come and see some of the things that are happening here at the arts. Without further ado, I don't want to take up any more time. Um, let me introduce Ms. Susan Cryle. Uh, there, there are two basic poles to my work. And one of them is beauty, and the other is what's often in beauty, and that is a sense of mor mortality and loss. And so that's something that runs just has been running through my work, but it's really split into two very distinct areas. One is far more political, which obviously the work here is, and then the other is more slanted towards the beauty slash mortality <laughs> uh, aspect. So I'm going to just run through the other segment of my work in about 10 minutes. I'm not going to say too much. This, there, there are lots of parts of it that are not here. My life's been too long and there are too many series. So <laughs> I would bore the hell out of you <laughs> if I actually showed them all. So um, back in the 60s, when I first really started painting, we have, OK. Um, I was working with still life. And I, when, when I started painting, I often joked that I, I became a painter in order to learn how to see. Uh, I had a lot of eye problems as a kid. And uh, that has been something that's run through my work, the whole issue of perception of what you know, how you know it, what you see, when you see it. So when I did these still lives, next, um, I, I was actually painting them for long periods of time, and the squashes would start, start rotting while I was painting them. So I, and I would paint that as that was happening. So time got woven into it, rot got woven into it, and yet the underlying beauty was there. So the, it really is beauty and thanatos, death in a way. Uh, the next series was the rug series, and these uh, were Again, in some way, the, the pattern has been an underlying issue all the way through, through my work, and pattern with its many, many dimensions, both its quotidian that comes out of the kind of daily use and the sort of fine high art. And when I was a teenager, I went to, uh, uh, to, to Syria, and I was in Damascus and saw those, th those incredible mosques. And I also was in the desert in Bedouin tents and saw the quotidian daily crafted rugs and wall hangings. So these kinds of things are things that keep running through the work as a kind of dialogue, as a kind of, of, of uh, questioning. Um, another one of the rug series, and here I've, I've put my dining room table and my furniture under it, and it took me six months to paint this. Uh, and it became a kind of cartography as well which led into a series of, of mappings uh, we're on the next one, sorry. This is the, that led into a kind of mapping and um, which actually led to a series of maps which I don't have because those files are just a mess and I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't get them to work with the technical problems I was having in the last few days. So the maps are going to be skipped over. Then I moved into a period of abstraction which lasted about 12 years and I was dealing with, again, a lot of the kinds of things out of perspective, perception, uh, the breaking apart, 
and breaking apart in different ways and kinds of ways in terms of scale, in terms of, of uh, panels put together, like this is like 18 feet shaped, five panels, um, and uh, again working with the space of the room. And a lot of the issues that were coming up here were uh, again about how you know what you know, about uh, perception, about breaking apart the, the traditional canvas into many parts where the wall becomes the matrix for them. Um, this is a, another one. These are all pretty large. Like this is like nine feet. Uh, this is probably eight feet tall. Um, then this was a screen, multi-paneled multi screen, about eight feet tall, and this is what it looks like from the side. Um, then then the, towards the end of the abstract, I mean, this was a series that was basically on gender. And it was on what it is to be male and what it is to be female, and what is that crossover between the two. Um, and that led to this series of snakes. Uh, the snakes were really the, the, the link between the Fires of War, which is the first political group I did, and these gender-based sexualized abstractions. And this really ties in again to the horror and the beauty, because the snake is, a, is such an image of mixed messages, mixed feelings, uh, mixed metaphors. <laughs> Okay, so there's one more of them. And then, uh, then, then the, the next series, which takes place uh, after the first Gulf War. By the way, I, I've always felt that once I started doing the political work, I felt I did not want to be an ambulance chaser. The only way I was going to do a, a political piece of work was if it grabbed me by the neck, a little like U Ulysses with Proteus where he grabs him by the neck until he will tell him the truth. Now that's the way I feel about doing these. I have to feel so dedicated to doing it because I don't want to just trivialize, trivialize it with uh, trying to find the next ambulance to, to follow. Um, this actually is uh, from the whole series I did on cathedrals and basilicas in, in Italy. This was in Verona. This always remind me, reminded me of Marci Marci Marcius's uh, the, uh, f flailing of Marcius. And later on, I'm showing the slide of Marcius <laughs> in relation to Guantanamo or Abu Ghraib, one of them. Uh, again, part of that whole series, working with the tiles, with the patterns, with the, with the aspects of, of, um, of, you know, it's funny because I, 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 they, they're not religious, but they are about having some sense of something that is beyond you. This is an eight-foot painting um, that's, ta that's based on some of the um, frescoes at San, San, Fr San Francisco, the uh, uh, of Assisi, the basilica. And that basilica particularly interested me because from mid medieval times on in that basilica, it is a mishmash of these patterns that come from everywhere. They come from Roman, they come from early Christian, they come from, they're Arabic. Uh, and they're all kind of intermixed together. And so that for me was a really interesting point to look at and think about. Um, these are also the Assisi ones. These are based from, based on parts of the, uh, the, f the frescoes that are about pattern and decorating the spandrels and so forth. Shaped canvas here. And then after I'd done all the uh, Abu Ghraib for a few years, where I'd been working so closely from photographs, and not with very little creativity about how I structured it, I thought, I've got to go back and do some abstract paintings because that really opens your mind up to thinking about how you put things together, how you use different aspects of your vocabulary. And I felt I really needed to open that up again. So I did this series 
of small paintings on 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 uh, gesso board. They're like 12 inches square, uh, 11 by 14 inches, which are really small for me. Um, and then the final series of this part, uh, these are the, the walls of Rome, and I call them the disappearing colors of the walls of Rome. Rome has decided, I think very ill-advisedly, to paint all of its buildings the colors they were when they were built. That means that a city that literally is a flame with ochres and oranges and uh, burnt orange and, burnt, and burnt siennas is now pale gray, pale, pale blue, off white and cream, and it feels like a bloodsucker got into them. And also I've been fascinated with the Rome walls. I've always been fascinated by walls because I think walls are a record of the civilization that, that you're looking at. And here uh, they are, they have the weirdest things in them. Things, I have no idea what they are or what they're for. Um, boxes and holes and... <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's that first stage. Now I'm going to read to you. <laughs> so part one is the fires of war. Oh, I just want to say, to begin with, that um, I, 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 when I started these, went, went to Kuwait in 1991, I had no idea that I was, what I was in for, because I've turn, it's turned out that I've now been tracking basically the outcome of our involvement, our thinking about, and the effects of being overly and excessively dependent on and milita militarant about oil. So the, first of all, there's, the, there's the, the war with Kuwait, with, with Iraq over the oil in, in Kuwait. Then the second thing is 9-11, which is an outcome of that. That's, that, that's a direct outcome of what happened because of, of the reaction in the Middle East to our involvement. And then how we responded after 9-11 with incarceration. Uh, and how that affected also, it made, it made ISIS and Al-Qaeda into a hydra where you cut off one head and 40 more get, 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 get made. So, and then I've been working on the BP oil spill, which is again, in terms of the environment, that's like another whole thing. So oil is a very, very big factor uh, in where we are right now. And, and under, even though I'm talking about incarceration and torture, not enough can be said about where we are in relation to climate and the environment, because that's really, for all of you, that's the big deal. And it's, you're going to have to pay a lot of attention to it, and not just 10 years from now, but now, because there isn't much time left. Anyway, after my little lecture there, in my work, <coughs> the opposing poles of beauty and horror often clash so that the viewer confronts different sets of emotions. My art becomes a platform for witnessing, drawing its powers from my own deep-seated beliefs that war is inhuman and that human ep empathy is necessary. The dark side of beauty has always been central to my work. Sometimes that darker side reveals itself in the imprint of mortality. At other times, that darkness illuminates the tragedy of the human condition, as in the exhibition here at the Friedman Gallery. The two series, Abu Ghraib, Abuse of Power, and In Our Name, Guantanamo and Black Sites, are about what man can do to man with no moral justification. Torture is wrong, it's illegal, both nationally and internationally, and we should never condone it, whether it was done at black sites in other countries under CIA supervision, at the Guantanamo prison run by the U.S. military outside the rule of U.S. law, or in our own prison system within the United States. The great Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote, quote, the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons, unquote. 9-11 escalated an era in which anything goes in the name of national security. An extraordinary amount of information that we the people should know 
is now not available to us. No one can act as a full citizen if she or he is not informed. Go vote, everybody. Additionally, it has become harder and harder to be informed when we live in a time when truth is no longer truth. Today, our civil liberties are being eroded. We have seen rightful demonstrators as well as courageous American whistleblowers jailed. The vitriol against the press has made it more dangerous to be a journalist and threatens the very freedom of the press guaranteed by our Constitution. Truth is truth, and it is important to have a record of it. That belief, along with a hatred of injustice, is what compels me to do the work I do. Kuwait, the fires of war. In 19, that's, an, that's a lake of oil that you were, you're looking at. In 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait over issues of debt, borders, and who owned the hijacked oil. In 1991, the U.S. with a coalition of other countries went to war to oust Iraq from its occupation of Kuwait to solidify our access to oil. We watched the Gulf War unfold on the nightly news. It was a TV war. The American government devised a sanitized PR language that was picked up by the press. Collateral damage meant civilian deaths. To neutralize was to kill. To visit something was to bomb it. And the bombs were smart bombs that somehow didn't hit civilians. The government, with the consenting press, uh, had created a buffer zone of language between reality and responsibility. Newspaper publishers and TV news executives cooperated with the Pentagon, allowing their reporters to be pooled and kept away from the action, except for a few that represented the pool and were embedded with our troops. Reporters were effectively sidelined and controlled. When the fighting ended, the mainstream media and press coverage rapidly disappeared, although 95% of the oil wells were still spewing poisons and black smoke across the region. Much of the scientific com community, including famous astrophysicist Dr. Carl Sagan, feared that this, if this immense plume reached the stratosphere, there would be a nuclear winter that would disseminate the region and affect the whole world. Four months after the war ended, I went to Kuwait, and I spent several weeks in the burning oil fields. I joined one of the firefighting crews, Boots and Coots, and traveled through the Burgan fields, the largest of the old fi oil fields, with Noel Knight, the uh, chemical engineer and safety director in charge of the cleanup for Bechtel. Nearly all the 700 wells that had been de detonated were still either burning or gushing oil onto the desert. Due to the density of the smoke, smoke plume, the oil fields were pitch black at noon. The thunderous fires roared like a squadron of jets taking off, and their deafening sound was punctuated by an even louder explosion of bomb bomblets and cluster bombs. When the winds shifted the fires, huge lakes of hot oil were ignited, and roads that were open one moment were in flames the next. Tar rained from the sky. When I stepped out of the vehicle to take a picture, my shoes got stuck in the tar and had to be pried out. In this surreal world of fire and tar, where nothing looked like anything I'd ever seen before, there were moments when the history of art flickered by. John Martin on the top, a uh, painting of the destruction of Pompeii, Francesca Goya's on the bottom, black paintings, Otto Dix and An Anselm Kiefer's paintings of the war-torn pock surface of the earth, and the diffusion of light and matter of J.M.W. Turner. Above all, it was a post-apocalyptic scene where Mad Max, Max met Alice in Wonderland in Dante's Inferno. When I returned to my studio, though I had well over a thousand photographs, which at that time was a lot before the digital camera, I still had to reinvent the structure of the space. The photos, even with a wide-angle lens, captured only a slice of the 360 degrees surrounding. I worked from photos, sketches, and notes I'd taken in the fields and began to create panoramic working drawings. Then I used the materials of oil and fire, the coarseness of pumice and tar, the glossiness and viscosity of oil paint, the grittiness of oil stick and charcoal, which is itself a remnant of fire, to make large-scale paintings and works on paper. The fire next time, which is 40 feet long uh, in five panels, the largest of the these is the largest of these works. To bring the viewer into the painting, into a painting such as this, I skewed the pers perspective 
inverted planes, shifted scale. I used multiple points of view to break into the horizon line in an effort to destabilize both vision and equilibrium. My methods were akin to the devices used in 15th century Florentine painting and Sienese paint, uh, Florentine and Sienese painting to show narrative and lapse of time as can be seen in such works as Benozzi Gozzolo's fresco, The Procession of the Magi at the Palazzo Medici. I felt a kinship with those earlier artists who painted the birth, death, and in resurrection of Christ and made beauty of horror and horror of beauty. 9-11, uh, the World Trade Center. On 9-11-2001, there was a sky so blue, bluer than blue. It was a perfect autumn day. On that day, the world as we Americans knew it was changed. The collapse of the World Trade Center foreshadowed the instability of the world we now live in and our vulnerability as its consequence. Because of expanded global media, images of the World Trade Center bombing were seen instantaneously around the world, announcing both real and symbolic power of a few to create an amount of damage that previously had been the arena of warring nation against warring nation. This method of warfare, although not exactly new, had mutated into a virulent form. Without belaboring the point, the penetration and explosion of the World Trade Center can be seen as an act of male power. The drama was a metaphor intended to be seen and photographed and remembered by all across the globe. My 9-11 series speaks to the precariousness and instability resulting from this new warfare. It showed that even a singular architectural symbol of Western capitalism, the World Trade Center, could shudder, crumble, and be gone in a flash, brought down by nine determined men. In my drawings, I focused on the vulnerability of the, of the moments of in-between that represents the unknowable between the impact and explosion, between the breaking apart and the falling, between the crashing to the ground and the subsequent rising of ash, between life and death. My visual sources came from magazines, newspapers, and photographs. I went up and took photos from one of the skyscrapers still standing that looked over the gaping wound of the Twin Towers. I took photos of the video footage on TV that allowed me to catch consecutive moments which paralleled the vibration of dust, cloud, debris, and free fall in time, space, and memory. In some of the works, there's a ghostly impression of architectural structures in rubble and a thick, luminous light an uncanny sense of what was there and is no longer. To do this, I used paper rather than canvas and worked in charcoal and pastel because of their transitory and fugitive qualities. The powdery material of these drawings evokes disintegration and ash. The way light sits on the chalky surface reinforces each mark. I used the paper in grids or diptychs to create t tension between the architecture of ordered, the ordered geometry of the grid and the chaos of collapse. The camera acts as a point of stability in the midst of turmoil. It can catch a single moment that is gone the next. In my drawings, I show the glare of the flash on the TV screen as it obliterates part of the, of the image or the splatter that polka dots the lens of a camera surface. These traces of the camera allow it to be observer and witness recording as the knitting of Madame Dufarge and Dickens's Tale of Two Cities encodes the future. The pro procession of people fleeing and the remains of the World Trade Center marked another state of being. They are in the midst of escaping their own death while they experience the death of others in the most physical, horrendous way possible through the air they breathe. Having barely escaped death themselves, they have literally experienced the death of others in the most physical way possible through their breath. They are living inside the horror of war, where dwelling, where they are dwelling in the horror of it. Abu Ghraib, Abuse of Power. In response to 9-11, the United States declared a war on terror against Al-Qaeda, an amorphous enemy. 
Like a hydra, al-Qaeda replicated itself in multiple forms with each new U.S. killing of, of Iraqi and Afghani civilians. In 2001, it was an organization with no homeland. At its height of power several years ago, al-Qaeda, ISIS, and, and other offshoots occupied and had governance in large swaths of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. The war against ter terror that started more than 17 years ago still has no foreseeable end in sight. Um, and it's also our longest war, I believe. Among its historian, is that correct? Uh, among its legacies are the tremendous prisons that I've painted and drawn. Abu Ghraib in Iraq, the black, black sites in numerous countries, including Egypt and Morocco, th that cast a blind eye on torture, as well as Guantanamo Bay prison. Uh, at Abu Ghraib prison, sexualized and brutal photographs were taken by American soldiers of the torture and abuse of prisoners. They hit the internet in 2004. The combination of boredom, the anything-goes morality fostered by reality TV, and the soldiers' access through the internet to friends and family at home created a perfect storm. The soldiers' ultimate crime for which they were punished dearly was letting the cat out of the bag that there were secret practices of torture and abuse. These crimes had been authorized by top U.S. officials, including Vice President Dick Cheney, None of the architects of the torture program were ever punished, let alone held accountable. The U.S. government denied culpability and said that torture and abuse was the deranged work of a few bad apples. But these methods of enhanced interrogation, a euphemism for torture, had been at play by the, by the CIA at the School of the Americas in Panama, where it used the Kubark Manual for Counter-Interrogation to train Latin American dictators and death squad leaders in interrogation techniques. The soldiers' photos that went viral are the bedrock of my Abu Ghraib series. I do not elaborate or exaggerate them. What I do is reinterpret and recontextualize them. The photos are devastating graphic images of humans being degraded. These images of inflicted pain dismantle America's image of itself as the moral voice of the world. We were torturers, both physical and psychological. Dogs ready to attack the genitals of a naked man, the thumbs up of a soldier over the tortured to death body of a prisoner, the naked hooded men piled on, on one another in a suggested homoerotic pyramid of human flesh. I show the disparity between the prisoners who appear naked, fragile, often deprived of sight, hooded or blindfolded, and the interrogators who are physically massive with layers of clothes, boots, vests, and excessive flesh and attitude. The Red Cross testimonials of the prisoners gave me a deeper understanding of the visual asymmetry between the gestures and the stances of power of the guards and torturers and the vulnerable bodies of the prisoners themselves. The philosopher Elaine Scarry discusses in her important book, The Body in Pain, when the body is subjected to torture, the protection of the skin dissolves and the self no longer has a safe container. It is afloat, defenseless, unmoored. In drawing, erasing, redrawing, and reworking, I'm shoring up the boundaries of the body while I struggle to reveal the fragile line between inside and outside where identity is either intact or falls apart. I cropped the photos to bring focus to an attention or horrible deed. While drawing, I must find the exact curve of a line so that the pain is evident in the gesture of the body and one feels it in the bowed back and the tucked buttock. The emptiness of the sheet of paper is like the cell. I use grayed out or muted colored papers to increase the institutional bareness of the space, the chill and dullness of the cement prison floor. The frame of the empty page is like the cage itself. The figures brush against its limit, the edge. The photo photographer and we the viewers are seeing the same thing and are brought into an intimate relationship with the victim and the violator. We are looking over the photographer, painter's shoulder and are complicit as both witness and voyeur of this awful scene. 
The Abu Ghraib photos <clears throat> are particularly disturbing since they were taken with the intent not to have an empathic connection to the suffering of the prisoner, to the horror of it all, but are instead meant to show his weakness in the face of might and even sometimes to provide entertainment. Part four, Guantanamo and black sites. Here we have an image of a man forced to stand on tiptoes for three hours in water up to his chin on a secret prison, in a secret prison in Cairo. A legal British resident, resident of Libyan descent was arbitrarily picked up and imprisoned in a Pakistani black site. He was put in a small room with caged snakes, with his captor, which his captors threatened to release. An Ethiopian-born Australian citizen was rendered to a Moroccan black site where he was brutally tortured for many months before being transferred to Guantanamo. His penis was sliced with a scalpel over 30 times. The U.S. rendered prisoners to these black sites in allied countries where torture could be conducted in secrecy supervised by the CIA. All of these, men, these prisoners, these men, were subsequently sent to Guantanamo where they didn't fare much better. There they were tortured and humiliated, never charged with a crime, never brought to trial. When they were released years later, there wasn't even an apology. This is the case with the preponderance of Guantanamo's 780 prisoners, all but 41 of whom have now been released, Some, most of them, many of them having been there over a decade. Since 1903, the U.S has had a long-term lease, uh, lease from Cuba for a military installation at Guantanamo Bay. Remote, shielded from the press, and congressional oversight it was a perfect location for an invisible prison to house enemy combatants. The Justice Department constructed a rationale that made torture legal outside the U.S. and its territories, despite both the Geneva Convention and the U.S. laws forbidding torture anywhere. Under the supervision of Alberto Gonzalez, the White House counsel to President Bush, torture was redefined as organ failure, impairment of bodily function, or even death. Almost any amount of pain and suffering could be inflicted on a prisoner and not legally be considered torture. The new definition segued perfectly with the CIA's $91 million contract awarded to the psychologists James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen, experts in learned helplessness, uh, which was, which was given to them to develop a, a torture program. They had no experience with either interrogation or the Middle East. The FBI, which had previously gotten invaluable information from prisoners through traditional psycho, uh, psych psychological interrogation, maintained and still maintains that torture does not work. When the pain becomes intolerable, the prisoner will say anything to make it stop. Instead of torture being a means to get information, it was used in Guantanamo as an end in itself. Torture for the sake of torture. At Guantanamo, CIA interrogators worked with its new enhanced interrogation program, using military psychologists and medical doctors, reminiscent of Germany during World War II, to experiment and validate Mitchell and Jensen's untested theories on how to break prisoners. Daily, if not hourly, contract was maintained with high-level officials in Washington, both in judicial and executive branches, including Vice President Dick Cheney, to determine the effectiveness of the ongoing interrogations. After the horrifying photos from Abu Ghraib went viral, there, there has, there's been a very tight lid on all images coming out of Guantanamo. And, and to my knowledge, no photos of abuse or torture have been leaked. My drawings are, are reconstructed from testimonials, depositions, and texts taken from the prisoners' words, their lawyers, and human rights organizations. Each material I use designates a different state or expression of the body and or mind of the prisoner and points to the duration of time he has been in that state. In Hanging Man, one-legged prisoner has been suspended by his wrists for weeks. To increase his pain, his prosthetic leg was taken away, forcing him to balance on, only one on his only one leg. I paint the cell with matte clay, 
uh, to contrast with the shimmering luminosity of pastel that draws attention to the points where the prisoner suffers pressure, edema, pain, and uh, pressure, pressure, edema, pain, and shame. That is, the hands, the foot, the head, and the groin. The tactility and luminosity of pastel becomes like a spotlight, drawing attention to specific areas of distress. The psychologists at Guantanamo were charged with ferreting out the phobias of the detainees, contrary to the Hippocratic oath the doctors had taken, to do no harm. These phobias became a part of the arsenal used to psychologically dismantle the prisoners. For example, detainees were nailed shut into small airless black boxes, which were as small as 29 inches by 29 inches by 20 inches, which you'll see downstairs the size of it. With the creatures they most feared, such as rats and stinging insects, wasps and bees, the men were left in the boxes for up to 18 hours at a time. I paint the boxes with flat black gesso paint that eats up the light and creates a dense darkness around the cramped body that is trying to evade the rat or the insect. When I install the black box drawings, I hang them abutting the floor so that you, the viewer, feels how small the box is. I'm asking you, your body, to identify with him, his body. In the diptych solitary 39 by 39 inches, five months, in which the size of the drawing is the footprint of the cell, 39 by 39 inches, I scrawl in white chalk its size and the length of time spent in it. I try to understand the awful condition of five months in a one square meter. I mark out 39 by 39 inches on my studio floor and I sit in the square until discomfort sits in. My foot goes to sleep or my hip begins to ache. Then I multiply that by hours, weeks, and months. In this way, I can just begin to feel the confinement rather than simply measuring, measuring it. I use the clay paint to make a distressed ground that shows the repeated agitated squirming of the body seeking relief from intolerable sustained discomfort. A buildup of faint layers of past movements is rendered in ghostly tra traces in contrast to the more defined position of the single moment. The paleness of the drawing represents the inwardness that is the necessity for survival. This painting of, of Titian's, of the flaying of Marci Marcius, uh, in, is, one sees such an inward state. And if you can look at it and see his face, the actual flaying is so horrendous. The, the exposure of the fascia, the inner muscles, yet Marcius's expression is almost one of rapture. In order to survive, he has had to go deeply inside into a state of non-being, in this case, religious ecstasy. In solitary, perhaps, it's more a state of self-abnegation. Some of the methods of torture, both psychological and physical, were designed to minimize any visible damage, thereby leaving no record of evidence or abuse. Detainees spent years in solitary confinement were subjected to sensory deprivation or sensory excess. Excessive blaring music, heat or cold, lights on 24 hours a day, deprivation of sleep for weeks on end, deprivation of daylight or exercise, of solid food or medical treatment. They were kept naked and shackled in freezing cells for weeks, if not months. They were waterboarded and were rectally fed for no health benefit, hogtied and humiliated by daily cavity searches whenever they were taken out of their cells. A few items they were allowed, toilet paper, soap, clothing, bedding, and their Koran, were taken away and given back for minute infractions at whim. All this was to break them psychologically and to remove any sense of self or shred of personal dignity. Much of the tor torture I've been describing is centered on interrogation. These team interventions were another form uh, of violent punishment dispensed on a daily basis by the I IRF which stands for Initial Reaction Force. The prisoners, however, called them the ERF, or Extreme Reaction Force. Each team was comprised of five Special Force soldiers decked in full gear, gas mask, body armor, thick black gloves, mace, and weapons. They entered like a tsunami with no warning. They, the assault, they, they assault with violence and leave. Often they have been summoned because of an infringement or a minor rule, such as having an extra styrofoam cup 
in a cell. They're called the pacifying team. These squads throw the prisoners to the ground, shackle or hogtie them, urinate on them, in an act not unlike waterboarding that stimulates, dr stimulates drowning, they stuff the prisoner's head in the toilet. They punch them, dislocate their shoulders, defile their Korans. In at least one case, they opened a prisoner's eye, sprayed mace directly in it. Years later, he was released from Guantanamo with no charge, blinded in that eye. Starting in 2005, the prisoners protested their own with their own bodies, the only thing they had even partial control over, what they ate or refused to eat. The hunger strikes that, that, pro, that protested both their innocence and their mistreatment were met with sadistic cruelty. They were strapped down in restraining chairs with tubes too large for them that were forced down their throats. Liquids were pumped into them so rapidly they often vomited. When the feeding was over, the overly large feeding tubes were yanked out of one prisoner's throat and often reused on the next prisoner, still covered with blood and pus. The prisoners were not only forced fed orally, but rectally as well, a procedure that the Senate Select Committee report on the CIA detention and interrogation program said was of no medical value at all. It appears there is no purpose for this sexualized torture except to cause pain and humiliation and to punish the prisoners for persisting with their hunger strike. In summation, when the immorality of torture, of repression, of dehumanization is allowed to flourish in one part of society, it cannot be cordoned off from the rest. What is allowed at the upper echelons of government seeps down to the rest of us. Permission is given to civil society to follow suit. We collective, collectively must not allow this to happen. Thank you. By rendering these in a different medium with a different set of values, do you redeem that humiliation? Do you? I, I, you know, it's a very good question, and I don't really know the answer to it. But what I, I can tell you what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make it po possible. You know, and here's where beauty comes into, because a lot of these images have got a certain level of, of an odd kind of beauty to them as well. And I see that as an entryway for people to get in, and then hopefully to see what's happening and to begin to think about what that means. What that means as a human being to a human being. And so, I mean, I'm hoping to elicit empathy. Now, you know, these things can always turn. I remember when I was doing the, the, the uh, fires of war, a lot of people just thought they were aestheticized. Uh, so, and that's a fine line between aestheticization and not. But, but I do think that there's something, and, and with the fires of war, part of what I wanted to show was something that was like the beginning and the end of the earth, something that was apocalyptic, but also had that kind of, of horrendous beauty of the sublime. Uh, but I, I don't know if that answers your, your question. Yes. Yes, I have a question in terms of how you mentioned that for Abu Ghraib you're using photographs, which of course, they were publicized, like they were published, they came up on the media. But you don't have um, photographs of Guantanamo Bay. Uh, these are just things that the there, you know, by the time, by, by the, 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 the government was so angry that these got out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, the fact that they, that they actually said that these guys were not doing something they should do. I mean, this Kubark manual that was made for for interrogation, all of these things are in it that we did in Panama, that we talked to South Americans, and that we trained our own CIA with. So this is something that's been a standard operating procedure for a very, very, very long time. Now, when they found out that these photographs got out, were let out of the bag, they did everything they could to distance themselves from having any part of it. So that they, so these. I think there are about six or seven of these 
sergeants and privates first class, they went to jail for up to 10 years for something that was really about having taken photographs of them. <laughs> so, well, my question is more about um, oh, well, go, but, going from, but, going but, from but, documents, oh. like going from documentation to basically recreating something well, that you're I'm, reading But I'm about. also recreating from text. So I'm, well, I'm, I'm reading what the prisoners said about what happened, mm -hmm. what their lawyers said about what happened, what the uh, human rights organizations said what happened. And then I try and fill in from that. I'll go to the internet and I'll see what a, what a, a uniform looks like for the army, or I'll look mm -hmm. at you know, stuff like that. But, but basically, of torture, I, as far as I know, there are no photographs that have been leaked out. Mm -hmm. so, so it's really about trying to figure out what the experience is to extrapolate that from, from what they said. Yes? I just wanted to know, like, when you're creating your art pieces, like, what do you feel as you're making them and also how does that like relate to what like information that you have about these events and how does that translate into the way you portray your like pieces? It's a good question. Well, I mean, first of all, when I'm making them, the thing the the point that's the hardest is doing the research, reading about this. And I mean, I feel like crying, you know, just thinking about it. It's just so terrible what we're doing. I mean, it's so, I mean, we're not the only ones that are doing it. This is happening all over the world. People are behaving terribly towards one another. But, but we certainly have had a, ever since George Washington cut down the cherry tree and, and you know, said how, took mea culpa about it, we have had this idea that we are sort of truthful and good people and that that's, all you have to do is look at the, the civil rights history. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think that the hardest part is, is the reading about it. Once I actually start working on it, I'm just trying to get it. I'm trying to get it, whatever it is that thing that I'm feeling. Because I feel as if I'm a conduit. You know, I'm not trying to invent anything, but I'm trying to have something come through me and go out to you. Does that, is there some other piece of this that I'm not getting at? Oh, I was just saying like, how do you translate that into, like for example, like the way you, like your composition of the images, like just your relationship to the, like the actual events going on, like how does that, like, how does that show itself in the way you portray your images? Well, that, that I mean, that always depends. It always is, is that relationship between what you're trying to say, what you, what you think the, and not in a didactic way, but what you, what you feel is the central message you're trying to portray. And what kinds of physical means you have to try to find, artistic means, in order to do that. And that's going to be different for everything. So. With the, uh, with the Abu Ghraib, I was stuck with those photographs because they are important. That's part of the whole message, is that these photographs were taken. So I don't want to invent anything there, but I can move in on it. I can take a fragment of it, and I can show the heaviness of the, of the, of the uh, padded guards as opposed to the fragility of the, of the prisoners' bodies. So I can interpret it in a way that allows something to come through. Um, and I think the same, is that, that's different for each one. With, with the fires of war, they were massive composites because that slice of a camera, and I'm sitting in the middle of 360 degrees of flame. So how do you get the feeling of 360 degrees of flame? Well, I didn't, but I mean, I'm try that's what I'm trying to do. So I did composite drawings, you know, of, of lots of different photographs I had, of drawings I did, I put things together. I figured out that these long panoramic, you know, uh, formats were really important to do that. Um, 
And each, each, each thing is, is a bit different. But always, I always feel it's about trying to connect your materials to your ideas and to your feelings. And it's different all the time. Yes. Um, as I remember, those photographs uh, were taken uh, by a young woman. I think her name was Leela. No, no, she was the one who had the leash, the guy in the leash. They were um, taken. Yeah, she was in the. She was in the photographs. Oh, she was in. Yeah. Any, anyway, they were meant to be, I suppose, entertaining for someone. People. Well, I think I think that they were sending them home. Yeah. You know, they were sending them home to. I mean, but you know. I honestly think that you cannot underestimate the influence of reality TV. Here, here these guys are, these kids, they're in the middle of nowhere in Afghanistan. And, you know, they're trying to figure out how, I mean, I don't mean this, I, what happened is, is terrible. And, but I do see that they, they, had, they were dealing with their own problem you know, of, of how to deal with being there, and they didn't deal with it well at all. But I, I, I think that that kind of, that kind of, the horrible things that people do to one another on reality TV, that there was something about that that was in it. But there was a lot of sadism, a lot of sadism, and uh, Darby, who was one of the ones who I think took the photographs, I think he was one of the ones who took the photographs, um, I think he had been a prison, been a, been in a prison guard before. And you know, our U.S. prisons are not much better. I, I do want to do a third section on this on the U.S. prison system, because we do a lot of the same things in the U.S. prison system. Um, it's, and I do think that what Dostoevsky said is that you can tell what a civilization is like by how it treats its prisoners is a, is a wonderful, wonderful phrase and really important. Yes? In the face of all of this misery, how do you find the energy to keep going each day? <laughs> oh. Some days I don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. no, but you know, we're still here and a lot has happened and man is very resilient. And we've had a lot of luck. And, but I have to tell you, for all of you, you've got to get involved with climate change. Because that's the thing, that's the thing afoot for your generation. And if it just slides on the way it is, uh, you know, take a look at what's happening right now in South Carolina. Uh, there's, this storm is going to be a complete and utter disaster, actually in North Carolina. Um, in part because the, the coal mines have been putting their ash, which is totally toxic, in the rivers near the water. And with the storm coming, it's probably going to destroy the water, the, the drinking water and the water of that whole area, very possibly. These things are just, are, are, they're afoot. And, but you know, the thing is, I think you have to live every day you, ha you have to have awareness of these things. You have to do, do what you can about it. But you also have to live and have fun. Somehow. You can't, you know, you can't just be focused on this all the time. But you do have to be responsible. Yes. My, my hearing is a little off. That's why I'm wandering around towards all of you. <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> but can you elaborate on what you mean by the influence of reality TV? Because, like, on reality TV, like, I watch HGTV, so I don't see how that would translate. Well, I don't, I, I'm like, thinking more of what it was like maybe 20 years ago, 15, so what 20 was years ago. Reality well, TV I mean, like where, where, where people are, are, are uh, I mean, I didn't watch enough of it that I think I can even probably do it, but you're eating horrible slugs and doing all kinds of terrible like weird things. Yeah, that, yeah, that, like that, that kind of thing. I mean, weird, weird things that are really sort of awful. And yeah. Yeah. 
Well, if, if you think about it too, Aaron, like there, those shows pit players against each other, right? Like the game yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's like the Colosseum yeah. in Rome. Like Big Brother? <laughs> Big Brother, Survivor, those kinds of reality TV programs, you know, ultimately it's, as Survivor says, who can outlast, outwit, outplay, but also there is an element where you have to make someone trust you and then you turn that around and that's a form of emotional torture as well. So all of those things I think is, are the things that Susan is kind yeah. of referring to. That was um, well done. <laughs> She's just staying in my house and I'm getting a little smarter, right? <laughs> Other questions? For those of you who are a little bit shyer, you can probably catch Susan in the gallery and ask your question as well. Absolutely. But we want to thank you all for coming and certainly thank you, Susan, so much. We appreciate you sharing.